Okay, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne with humble hearts, eager to hear your voice speaking to us. I ask, Lord, that you will speak, that we might hear, accept, and obey. We thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. In Revelation chapter 1 we have a picture of the glorified Christ, the Christ that went to heaven. And uh, in verses 4 and 5 we have one particular detail that I want to focus on as we begin our study. It reads in the following way. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now what I want to especially focus on in our study is the expression, firstborn from the dead. If you read the introduction to the book of Revelation, you're going to find that at the beginning of chapter 1, there's a reference to the death and resurrection of Christ. And at the end of the chapter, once again, John comes back to the theme of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Why would there be a focus on the resurrection of Christ at the very beginning of the book? The reason is very simple. We're going to find that in order for the lamps of the sanctuary to continue burning, to have sufficient oil to give light, it is necessary for Jesus Christ to be alive. Because a dead Jesus Christ could never fill the lamps with oil. And so the resurrection of Christ is dwelt upon profusely in chapter 1. And you'll notice that he's called the firstborn from the dead. Now what does that mean? That does not mean that Jesus was the first to resurrect. Because in the Old Testament we have at least three individuals who resurrected. We have Moses, we have the son of the widow of Zarepta, and we have that man who was thrown into a pit where Elisha's dead body was, and he, when he touched the body of Elijah, he revived. So we have three resurrections, at least in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, before the death of Christ, we also have three. We have the daughter of Jairus, we have the son of the widow of Nain, and of course, the resurrection of Lazarus. So firstborn from the dead cannot mean that Jesus was the first to resurrect. In fact, the word firstborn doesn't have to do with being the first in time, it has to do with being the first in preeminence or importance. The expression firstborn from the dead means that the resurrection of Jesus determines the possibility of all of us resurrecting if we should die. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. So firstborn from the dead does not mean he was the first to be born. It means that he's first in the sense that his resurrection determines the possibility of our resurrection. You know, it's similar to the expression, the firstborn of all creation. You know, there's one church that says that that means that Jesus was literally firstborn, the firstborn creature in the universe. That's not what firstborn of all creation means. It means that Jesus is the preeminent above all creation. He is the preeminent one. He is the important one. He is the ruler, if you please. So the text begins by telling us that Jesus resurrected from the dead, and His resurrection determines the possibility of ours. Now, how important is the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, there are people who say, well, when Jesus died on the cross, He forgave everyone's sins. That's not technically true. When Jesus died on the cross, He did not forgive everyone's sins. Sin is forgiven when we repent of it and when we confess it. Forgiveness is an individual thing. 
Now, I'm going to read a couple of verses, actually three verses, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I invite you to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. This will show you that really, when Jesus died on the cross, He did not forgive everyone's sins. What He did was make provision so that sins could be forgiven. In other words, He provided the benefit available for those who claim the benefit of His life and His death. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So the death of Christ did not get rid of everyone's sins, because if Jesus didn't resurrect, we would still be in our sins. Verse 18, Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if Jesus did not resurrect. If Jesus did not resurrect, there is no hope for the dead ever to rise. Now, when Jesus uh, resurrected from the dead, He spent 40 days on this earth, and then the Bible tells us that after the 40 days, Jesus ascended to heaven. Now the question is, where did Jesus go when He ascended to heaven? You know, there are some scholars in our church, and um, virtually all Protestant scholars, that say that Jesus went directly into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That cannot be true. Because Jesus lived His perfect life in our midst, in our camp, so to speak. Then He went to the altar of sacrifice and died on the cross. At the laver, He washes Himself of every vestige of sin, of death, because He bore our sins. And then, the next place in the sanctuary is a holy place. Jesus does not jump from the laver to the most holy place. The sanctuary tells us that Jesus had a role to fulfill in the holy place. Now I want to read a passage from the writings of Ellen White. This is in the devotional book, The Faith I Live By, where Ellen White describes the place where Jesus went when He resurrected from the dead after spending 40 days on this earth. The holy places of the sanctuary in heaven are represented by the two apartments in the sanctuary on earth. So on the sanctuary on earth, there were two apartments. In the heavenly sanctuary, there are also two apartments. She continues, As in the vision, the apostle John was granted a view of the temple of God in heaven. He beheld there the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. That's Revelation chapter 1. And then she continues, He saw an angel having a golden censer. This is chapter 5. He's still in the holy place where uh, having a golden censer, and there was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Then she makes this comment. Where was the altar of incense? In the holy place. Where was the seven-branched candlestick? In the holy place. So in the series on the churches, and in the series that deal with the seals, Jesus is in the holy place. She ends by saying this, Here the prophet was permitted to behold the first apartment of the sanctuary in heaven. And he saw there the seven lamps of fire and the golden altar represented by the ca golden candlestick and the altar of incense in the sanctuary on the earth. So Jesus went to perform a work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, what function was Jesus going to fulfill in the heavenly sanctuary? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verses 12 through 16. Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 through 16 describes what Jesus was going to do in heaven in the holy place. It says there, and John is seeing this in vision, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about his chest with a golden band. Now, if you look at other places in Scripture, you're going to find that this is a description of the attire of the high priest. The golden band 
And the robe, which is the poderes robe, represents the robe that is worn by the high priest in the earthly sanctuary. So what function is Jesus fulfilling in heaven? He is fulfilling the function of high priest. Then continues the description. His head and hair were like white wool. And of course, the, the, the color white represents purity, but the white hair represents wisdom according to scripture because an individual who is aged is an individual who is wise. So it says once again, his head and hair were like white wool, as white as snow, and we'll come back to this in a moment, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, we'll come back to that, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which we're going to dwell on as well, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength, which is the same uh, phrase that is used when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now there's no doubt that Jesus went to heaven to serve as our high priest. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 tells us as much. I want to read those two verses. The Apostle Paul wrote, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So here very clearly we are told that Jesus in heaven performs the function of high priest in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. What is Jesus doing in heaven as the high priest? Well, the first three chapters give us only one of the functions of Jesus. That is, Jesus is walking among the seven lampstands. In other sections of Revelation we'll find that he is at the table of the showbread and that he's at the altar of incense. Those are other functions. But we're studying the churches now, so we're going to take a look at the function of the high priest as it applies to the seven branch candlestick. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 reads, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now let's unpack that for a moment. In heaven there is a literal sanctuary with two literal apartments. There is a literal seven branch candlestick with literal oil in it. And Jesus up there keeps the lamps of the candelabrum burning by making sure that there's a sufficient supply of oil. But those seven branches of uh, candlesticks in heaven actually represent seven churches in Asia Minor. In other words, the seven lamps in the heavenly sanctuary represent the seven churches of Asia Minor. But we need to take it a step further. The seven churches in Asia Minor represent seven periods of church history from apostolic times till the end of time. So you have the literal candlesticks in heaven represent the seven churches of Asia Minor, and the seven churches of Asia Minor represent seven stages of the history of the Christian church from the beginning until the end of the history of the church. Last night I read a couple of statements to this effect, but, and I want to read them once again. In the book Acts of the Apostles, page 585, Ellen White wrote, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time, while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So you notice here she's saying that the uh, seven branch candlestick, yes, represents the seven churches in Asia Minor, but the seven churches represent 
the entire history of the ch Christian church from apostolic times till the consummation. Ellen White is not the only one that actually believes this. If you read the commentaries on Revelation by most Protestant scholars, you're going to find that they also believe that the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. Let me just give you one example which I read in our presentation last evening. It's found in Hal Lindsey's book, Vanished into Thin Air, page 276. And of course we disagree with most of what Hal Lindsey wrote, but he's right on this point. This is what he wrote, I believe, along with many scholars, that these seven letters were not only written to seven literal churches with real problems, but also that they have a prophetic application to church history. I believe that these seven churches were selected and arranged by our omniscient Lord because they had problems and characteristics that would prophesy seven stages of history through which the church universal would pass. So not only Ellen White, but also many other scholars believe that the seven churches represent or symbolize seven periods of church history, from the apostolic church, which would be Ephesus, to the final church, which appears to be Laodicea, but really the faithful church at the end of time we are going to find will be the church of Philadelphia, and we'll come back to that. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 1, and let's read verses 12 and 13. It says there, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and here comes the detail I want to dwell on for a while, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Once again, the, what is mentioned here uh, is the garb of the high priest. But you'll notice that in the midst of the seven lampstands is standing the Son of Man, who is Jesus Christ. But we need to understand that Jesus is not just standing there in the middle of the seven candlesticks. Jesus is actually walking among the seven candlesticks. And you say, where do you find that? In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, the very next chapter, we are told, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, and that will be our study this evening, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And so Jesus is not just static there, standing in the middle of the seven lampstands. Jesus is walking among the seven lampstands. What does that mean? Well, we have to go back to the Old Testament to fully understand it. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Leviticus 24 and verses 1 through 4. This is speaking about one of the tasks of Aaron the high priest one of his jobs in the holy place, if you please. He had many others, but this was one of them, and we're studying the seven candlesticks, so we need to dwell on that specifically. It says there in Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 4, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light, to make the lamps burn occasionally. Okay, good, you're reacting, you're reading it. So it says, to make the lamps burn what? They were never to go out, continually. Verse 3, outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord, continually. continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall be in charge of the what? In charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord, if you didn't get it before, continually. So the lamps were never to go out. Aaron was to make sure that the lamps always had sufficient oil and that the wicks were trimmed so that the seven lamps would never go out. Now we have three things here. We have a candlestick and we have the oil and we have the light that comes as a result. 
What does the oil represent? The oil represents, you know this, the Holy Spirit. In the parable of the ten virgins you have an example of this. Also in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So the oil represents the Holy Spirit. What does the candlestick represent? The candlestick represents the church in its different periods. We've already noticed that. Each branch of the candlestick represents one particular church. And what does the light represent? The light that is given by the candlestick, because the oil is in the candlestick, represents the witness of the church because the Holy Spirit is present in the church. The church then sheds light. Are you with me? Yeah. So Jesus as the high priest, what is he doing in the holy place? He is making sure that the lights of the candlestick never go out. He was working in the churches in Asia Minor so that the church would shed the light, that the Holy Spirit would be present in the church all the time. And also in the course of church history, Jesus is walking among the different churches throughout history, making sure that the light of the church never goes out because there's never an absence of oil. Amen. Now I must say that there were certain periods when it looked like the light was about to go out. You have for example what we call the dark ages. Hello, why would you call it the dark ages? Because there was very little light. Amen. The period of papal supremacy. There was, the, the Bible was suppressed and as a result the witness of the church was, was uh, impacted and yet the light of the church never went out. You had groups like the Waldenses and the Albigenses that were in exile. They kept parch pieces of parchment with scriptures. They always shed the light. It was dim, but it never went out because Jesus was walking in the midst of the church, even during the church of Thyatira. Ellen White gives a beautiful description of what it means that Jesus was walking in the midst of the candlesticks. In the book Acts of the Apostles, page 586, Ellen White wrote, Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. This is symbolized, this, excuse me, thus is symbolized his relation to the churches. He is in constant communication with his people. He knows their true state. He observes their order, their piety, and their devotion. Although he is high priest and mediator in the heaven above, in the sanctuary above, yet he is represented as walking up and down in the midst of his churches on earth. With untiring wakefulness, unremitting vigilance, he watches to see whether the light of any of his sentinels is burning dim or going out. If the candlesticks were left to mere human care, the flickering flame would languish and die. But he is the true watchman in the Lord's house, the true warden of the temple courts. He continue, his continued care and sustaining grace are the source of life and light. Amen. So Amen. Jesus makes sure that the light of the church never goes out. Amen. It might burn dim, but it never fully goes out. The Holy Spirit is not absent from the church. By the way, when church history comes to an end, God will withdraw His Spirit from the earth, but He will not withdraw His Spirit from His people. Amen. His people will still have the Spirit during the period of the tribulation. Now you notice that Jesus is not only walking among the seven candlesticks, He's not only walking the midst of the history of the Christian church to make sure that there's always enough oil so that the light of the church doesn't go out, so that the witness of the church never goes out, but the Bible says that he has in his hand seven stars. Now what do the seven stars represent? Revelation 1 verse 20 once again. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now uh, we need to understand what the word angel means, the word angelus. Angel means messenger. So really the angels to the churches are 
the ministers or the preachers of the church. Jesus has in his hand, and we're going to notice in a minute, his right hand, he has his preachers. Let's read this interesting statement from Acts of the Apostles, page 586. Christ is represented as holding the seven stars in his right hand. He assures us that no church faithful to its trust need fear coming to naught. For not a star that has the protection of omnipotence can be plucked out of the hand of Christ. Mercy. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. She's quoting Revelation 2 verse 1. Then she comments, these words are spoken to the teachers in the church. So this is for the, for the preacher and for me. This message is for us. It says here, these words are spoken to the teachers in the church. Those entrusted by God with weighty responsibilities. The sweet influences that are to be abundant in the church are bound up with God's ministers who are to reveal the love of Christ. The stars of heaven are under His control. He fills them with light. He guides and directs their movements. If He did not do this, they would become fallen stars. So with His ministers. They are but instruments in His hands, and all the good they accomplish is done through His power. What a beautiful description of the seven stars. They're the ministers. Jesus holds them in His right hand. Now why the right hand? In the Bible, the right hand is the hand of God's favor. That's why in the Bible, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. Incidentally, when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, he places the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. At the Last Supper, Judas was seated on the left side and John was seated on the right. And you know, in Spanish, you have the word siniestra. It means the left side. It comes from the word sinister. The left is the sinister side. What, what comes to your mind when we talk about sinister? It's negative, right? It's the bad side, in other words. So where does Jesus hold his ministers or his preachers? He holds them in the hand of his favor. Now, let's notice another symbol that we find here in Revelation chapter 1. We have the eyes of Jesus that look like flames of fire. Now I'm going to ask a dumb question. What do you use your eyes for? See. To see. That's right. To see. To discern. By the way, in the Bible, eyes represent wisdom or knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, it speaks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. See, when the Bible speaks about eyes, it's not only talking about your literal eyes, it's actually talking about discernment, having discernment, having understanding, seeing things spiritually. That's the reason why Satan said to Eve in the garden, your eyes will be opened. Now wait a minute, they had 20-20 vision, probably better than 20-20 vision. <laughs> she, was, she was seeing the serpent, she was seeing everything, but, but the devil is saying, your eyes will be opened. It can't be the physical eyes. He's saying, your understanding will be open. You'll be able to know good and evil without God telling you what good and evil is. You'll be able to have discernment for yourself. So in other words, the eyes represent wisdom, knowledge. It represents discernment. And that's the reason why, by the way, at graduation time, you go to a store to buy a graduation card. And what uh, animal appears on the graduation card quite frequently? An owl. Why would it be an owl? Because an owl has big eyes, and the person who's graduating is very wise. <laughs> so, so that's a contemporary uh, explanation of uh, what the eyes representing knowledge or wisdom. So Jesus has eyes of fire, which means that his eyes what? Are penetrating eyes. That's why to each church Jesus says, I know your works. To each church, he says, I know, I can see, I can discern, I'm wise, my eyes are enlightened, I can detect what the church is like. Now, also, we find another symbol of Christ in Revelation 1. And that is, and we read this, 
it says that out of the mouth of Jesus comes forth a sharp two-edged sword. Now what does the sword represent in the Bible? We don't have to guess. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 and verse 17, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And who is the Word of God? Well, this is the written Word of God. It gives witness to Jesus. But Jesus is the Word of God in person. So you have this sharp two-edged sword. By the way, I think the reason why it's a two-edged sword is because you have an Old and New Testament. It represents the Bible, the Word of God. Just like you have two witnesses in Revelation 11, the Old and New Testament. And it's very sharp. It's very penetrating, in other words. Now, what does this symbol mean? A sword that penetrates, the Word of God that penetrates. See, Jesus not only discerns everything, He not only knows uh, backwards and forwards what we're doing, but He also has the solution to the problem. Now let me read you an interesting statement. This was actually written by uh, an individual by the name of L.D. Fleming. He attended one of William Miller's uh, lectures back in the 1830s. This was in Portland, Maine. And he described the message of William Miller as, as a cutting message. Have you ever heard of uh, somebody refer to the message as a cutting message? That's because the word is penetrating, it's going in. And it's performing a work of surgery, if you please. See, Jesus detects the sin, and then he says, do you want me to cut it out with my word? Now notice what uh, testimony this man gave. Things here are moving powerfully. Last evening about 200 requested prayers, and the interest seems constantly increasing. The whole city seems agitated. Brother Miller's lectures have not the least effect to frighten people. They are far from it. The great alarm is among those who do not come near them. Many who stay away and oppose seem excited and perhaps alarmed, but those who candidly hear are far from excitement or alarm. The interest awakened by his lectures is of the most deliberate and dispassionate kind. kind. Though this is the greatest revival I ever saw, Yet there is the least passionate excitement about it. In other words, they weren't jumping and rolling in the aisles and shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. He continues, Though this is the greatest revival I ever saw, yet there is not the least passionate excitement about it. It seems to take a deep hold on the main part of the community. What produces the effect is this. Now notice the reason why. Brother Miller simply takes the sword of the Spirit, unsheathed, and lays its sharp edge on the naked heart, and it cuts. That is all. Before the edge of this mighty weapon, infidelity falls, and universalism withers. False foundations vanish, Babel's merchants wonder. wonder. It seems to me that this must be a little the nearest to apostolic revivals of anything that modern times have witnessed. All great revivals in the history of the Christian church have been founded on the preaching of God's holy word. Amen. Because the word penetrates, the word has power. It is quick and powerful. Quick means living and powerful. Now Ellen White also described uh, the, um, the word of God as a sharp object to cut out the maladies in the human heart. In Signs of the Times, May 17, 1883, she wrote these words. The worldliness in the church, worldliness where? In the church, which is the great cause of spiritual death, is attributable to the influence of selfish, ease-loving members. The progress of this deadly malady must be checked. The surgeon's knife cuts deep when it is necessary to remove festering pestilent matter. So the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, must be made to cut to the heart, or the evil will never be removed. So the eyes detect the evil, and the word cuts the evil out if we consent. But the sword will no, never cut out the evil unless we allow the sword to come in. Amen. Now let me give you an illustration so that we understand how this works a little bit better. 
A person goes to a medical doctor and has some tests, sonograms, x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, etc. After the tests results come back, the medical doctor says to the patient, I have bad news for you, you have cancer. But the doctor says there's good news, uh, the cancer has not progressed to a point where uh, we cannot have surgery and cut the cancer out. And so if you have surgery uh, you're going to recuperate 100%. What did, the, what did the medical equipment do? It allowed the medical doctor to detect the cancer, but the medical equipment cannot cure the cancer. The eyes of Jesus are like flames of fire, they detect sin when we're close to Jesus. He shows us our sinfulness, and then he says there's only way, one way to solve this, it still is, uh, uh, you know, it's still we can heal it, but I need to cut it out, there needs to be a surgery. Now what does a patient ask? The patient says, well is it going to hurt? <clears throat> The medical doctor says, of course it's going to hurt, big time. Oh well then I don't want to have the surgery. Is that what the patient says? Are you kidding? The patient doesn't say that. The patient says, better a little hurt now than a big hurt later. And so the Word of God penetrates and cuts out that which the eyes of Jesus detects. Now let me give you an illustration of what I mean. Let's suppose that an individual is addicted to pornography, a very growing problem in the world today. An individual is addicted to pornography, and that individual uh, one day opens the Bible and um, just so happens that he turns to the story of uh, David and his adultery that he committed with Bathsheba that eventually leads to the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And so he said, you know, he's reading the scriptures and suddenly the scriptures start reading him. <laughs> the scriptures say, hey that's you, that's you. See what is the word doing? The word is showing the person his what? His sin. And then what does the word say? You got to cut that out. It's going to hurt, it's not going to be easy to give that up, but I am willing to cut it out if you consent. And so that's why when we study scripture we need to pray for the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit shows us our sin, and then the Holy Spirit through the Word is willing to come in and cut that sin out from our life. Let me read you several statements from scripture about this specific point. Psalm 139, 22 and 23, you know the heart is deceitful above all things, isn't it? and desperately wicked is what the Bible says. You can, if you go by your heart you're always going to rationalize things, you're going to say this is okay, that's okay, but if you allow scripture to show you your condition through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be able to see ourselves as we are. Psalm 139, 22 and 23, we find the psalmist saying, search me, O God, and know my heart. See there's the eyes, know my heart and know my anxieties, and see if there is any way, wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Notice, discern if there's wickedness in me, and then lead me what? Lead me in the way everlasting. Now there's a very interesting passage in the book of Hebrews that puts the eyes and the sword together. Are you understanding this? The eyes detect the sin, and then the sword cuts out the sin, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, the eyes are Jesus through the Holy Spirit showing us our sinful condition. Hebrews 4 verses 12 and 13 puts the two symbols together. It says there, for the Word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow. So it's really penetrating, isn't it? If it's penetrating here to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, it's really going deep. And now notice the eyes, and is a what? A discerner, that has to do with the eyes, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, it even goes to the depths of the heart. 
And there is no creature hidden from his what? See that you have the sword and you have the eyes hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the what? Open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Amen. And you know folks sometimes the surgery hurts. The surgery hurts as much as it would hurt to cut off your foot. It hurts even more than poking out your eye. It hurts even more than chopping off, chopping off your right hand. And I'm speaking about the passage of Jesus in Mark chapter 9, 43 to 48. He says, if your right hand offends you, chop it off. He's not saying that we should be cutting off our limbs. What he's saying is that sometimes it's so difficult for us, it is as difficult for us to give up our sins as it would be to cut off our hand and our foot. It's painful. Now at the end of Revelation, we meet the eyes and the sword again. Now listen carefully. In Revelation 1, the eyes and the sword are remedial. In other words, they are willing to detect the sin, and the sword is willing to cut it out. At the end of Revelation, the context is different. The eyes are not remedial eyes. The sword is not a remedial sword. The eyes and the sword are retributive because people did not allow the eyes to detect the sin and the sword to cut out the sin. In other words, the eyes and the sword destroy at the end of the book. Notice Revelation chapter 19 verses 11, verse 14, and then we'll read verse 16. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. That's verse 11. That's Jesus, by the way. And the armies in heaven, the angels, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Those are the angels. Verse 16, And he, and he who sat on this, uh, on this horse, his robe and on his thigh, he had a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now, is Jesus coming here uh, primarily uh, as a Savior so that people can get rid of sin? No. Notice, once again, the eyes are spoken of in verse 12. It says, His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on His head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except Himself. We meet the eyes, once again, of fire at the end of the book. What happens when people who have not had the surgery performed, what happens with them when they see those eyes? Revelation chapter 6 tells us they hide in the caves and they cry for the mountains to fall upon them because hide us from the eyes of the one who sits upon the throne because they did not accept the eyes showing the sin and the sword cutting out the sin. Once again we meet the sword at the end of the book. Revelation chapter 19 verse 15 in the same context. It says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. No longer to cut out sin, folks. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should what? Strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself dreads, treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So we can either have the eyes detect the sin now and the sword cut it out, or else someday we will have to meet those eyes once again, and now the sword, instead of cutting out the sin, will destroy the sinner. You know, Jesus spoke something similar in Matthew 21, verse 44. He said, and whoever falls on this stone, he's speaking about himself, will be broken. In other words, if you fall on Christ, your selfishness will be broken. But now notice, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So you can choose to fall on the stone, or else the stone will crush you. We find the same lesson with regards to fire. Matthew 3 verse 11, the ministry of John the Baptist. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than me, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's talking about the day of Pentecost, saying, you are going to receive the Spirit into your lives, and that's going to help you overcome sin and witness for me. But if we don't allow the Spirit 
to consume the sin in our lives now, the fire at the end will consume us. Notice what we find in Desire of Ages, page 107. To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. In all who submit to His power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. What does the, uh, uh, what does the Spirit do? If we submit, consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it, then the glory of God which destroys sin must destroy them. Are you understanding the relationship between the eyes and the sword at the beginning and the eyes and the sword at the end? Folks, the devil has invented all sorts of distractions to keep, in, keep us from going to the Word. It's the Word that shows us our sinfulness. The eyes of Jesus detect our sinfulness through a study of the Word. It shows us what we're really like. And then, if we consent, the sword will cut out the sin from our lives. Now there's one final thing that I want to deal with in the a few minutes that we still have left. Let's go to the end of chapter 1. We notice that at the beginning you have the death and resurrection of Christ and He begins His ministry in the holy place. Now at the end of chapter 1, once again you have a reference to the death and resurrection of Christ. It says there in Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 and 18, And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. But He said, Oh, rather, he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives, and was dead, and behold, am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now let's talk a little bit about Hades and death. Go with me to Psalm 89 and verse 48. Psalm 89 and verse 48. It says there, What man can live and not see death? This is a synonymous parallelism, by the way. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Now the word grave there is the Hebrew word Sheol. Remember that, it's the word Sheol in Hebrew. So what is Sheol identified with? The grave and death. Psalm 6 verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you. And then the same thought is repeated in different words. In the grave who will give you thanks? So death and the grave go together. So the word Sheol in the Old Testament really should be translated grave. Unfortunately, the King James Version usually translates the word Sheol with the word hell. It's, it's, a, it's a really not a good translation, the word Sheol into hell, because the word Sheol means the grave. It's the place where dead people go. Now, in the New Testament, you have an equivalent word. See, in the New Testament, you're dealing with Greek. In the New Testament, it's the word Hades. It's used 11 times in the New Testament. And the King James Version usually translates the word hell. More modern versions transliterate it and they simply put Hades where the word Hades is. Now the word Hades is equivalent to Sheol. We should not study the word Hades in the light of the Greek philosophers. We should not study the word Hades in the light of what the Jews believed in the intertestamental period. We should allow the use of Sheol in the Old Testament to determine the meaning of the same word in Greek in the New Testament, Amen. Hades. So how do we know that Hades is equivalent to Sheol or the grave? We have one verse which is a key verse, Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. Hosea 13 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul is going to allude to this verse later on in 1 Corinthians. It says there, I will ransom them from the power of the Grave, that's Sheol by the way. God is going to rescue his people from the power of Sheol or the grave. And then the same thought is repeated, I will redeem them from death. And then you have these words, O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, that is Sheol, I will be your destruction. So can you think of a verse that is very similar to this? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 54 and 55. Now notice the word Sheol is used twice. I will ransom them from the power of the grave, Sheol. I will redeem them from death. 
O death, where? I will be your plagues. O grave, Sheol, I will be your destruction. The Apostle Paul alludes to this in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. He says, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? And by the way, interestingly enough, the King James Version translates the word Hades there, grave, because it wouldn't make much sense to say that Jesus is bringing up his people from hell. And so they translate the word correctly there. Now let's go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16 and pursue this a little bit further. Psalm 16 verses 8 through 10 have a messianic prophecy. David is writing about how Jesus is going to feel when he's about to go to the grave and when he's going to resurrect from the dead. Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 10. I have set the Lord, all, I'm reading from the New King James Version. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. This is Jesus speaking prophetically a thousand years before he comes. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. And then he says, for you will not leave my soul, the word nephesh in the Hebrew, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, the King James translates in hell. So Jesus went to hell according to this, according to the King James Version. We don't believe that Jesus went to hell when he died, do we? So, so it's a, a serious problem to read it in that fashion. So verse 10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, that is, uh, in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now I want you to notice that there's a synonymous parallelism here. The first part of the verse says, You will not leave my soul in hell, according to the G King James. The second half of the verse says, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. So let me ask you, what would be equivalent to soul in that equation? Holy One. You will not leave my soul in Sheol is equivalent to you will not leave your Holy One. And Sheol would be equivalent to what? To corruption. Let me ask you, where does corruption take place? It takes place in the grave. Now let's go to this passage in the New Testament. The Apostle Peter quoted these verses in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 27. And I'm going to read it from three versions, the King James, the New King James, and the New International Version. It says in the King James, For David, speak, David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh, this is Jesus speaking prophetically, shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, this is the King James Version, neither will you suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now what does the New King James do? I'll read the passage in the New King James. For David says concerning him, that is concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades. Notice that no longer is the word hell used, but Hades. The word, Greek word is transliterated. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now let's read it in the NIV. It makes so much more sense. It says in the NIV, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will, will not abandon me to the grave. Is that clear? So what is the soul? Me. me. And what is Sheol or Hades? Grave. The grave. That's a proper translation. So the Messiah is saying, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And Jesus was talking about his resurrection. 
in Acts 2 verse 31, it says, He, that is Jesus, uh, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now let me end by giving you an illustration. You see, Satan is the jailer, and the tomb is the jail. The dead are the prisoners. The jailer has the keys guarding the door, and dares Jesus to go into the tomb and get the keys. Jesus goes into the tomb, and lo and behold, he comes out of the tomb, and he says to the devil, Give me those keys. And so Jesus now takes away the keys. And Jesus has the keys to death and to the grave. In fact, Jesus defeated death by death. Do you know how they used to make anti-venom? With venom. So Jesus defeated death by death. Interesting. Notice Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken flesh and blood, that's us, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The last enemy, folks, to be destroyed is death. Amen. The devil is not the last, the last thing to be destroyed. The last thing to be destroyed is death. Because if uh, the devil, uh, you know, if death was destroyed first before the devil died, then uh, death would not have been destroyed. Are you with me or not? So the last enemy to be destroyed is death. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26 tells us exactly that. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that's why we have that glorious promise in Revelation 21 verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And it's all due to the fact that Jesus lived, died, took over the keys to the tomb, came forth saying, I am the resurrection and the life, because I live, you will live also, Amen. that there's any hope for those who die in Jesus Christ. Amen. If we are in Christ, we have no reason to fear death. Amen. If we're outside of Christ, we have every reason to fear death. Right. Because the Bible says that those who are not in Christ will suffer second death. And that is the death from which there will be no resurrection. Amen. 